Welcome to the Healing Grove Podcast. I'm Dr. Kristen Ryman, an integrative holistic family physician, author of Life After Lyme, and host in this virtual space of learning, healing, and growing. I believe humans are like trees, and our physical limb is only one of many. Health on all limbs of the tree, emotional, conceptual, social, spiritual, is absolutely required for the whole tree that is you to be vibrantly well. I created the Healing Grove podcast as a place to showcase some of the world's best integrative and holistic medicine, to expose you to transformative tools and mindset shifts for all limbs of your tree. I hope you enjoy our conversation in the Healing Grove today as much as I enjoyed having it. Welcome everyone to the Healing Grove. I see that Dr. Jack Wolfson has joined us. Hey there. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Sorry about the white background. I'm kind of in this white room uh, working out of our house with the kids yelling and screaming, the dogs in the background barking. So I, it's appropriate that I'm in like this padded uh, crazy person's room because that's how I feel. Uh, you're for the in, most you're part. kind of in, you're kind of in lockdown is what I'm hearing. Right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, it's so great to see you here. Thank you so much for being our guest in the Healing Grove Nest today. I'm so, so looking forward to this conversation, Dr. Jack Wolfson. So, so am I. awesome. Let's get started. So I'm going to do a quick introduction and I'll do it by way of saying, you know, we haven't met in person before. I've referred people to you. In fact, one of the people in the Healing Grove is the first person I ever referred to you because she was... Um, you know, dealing with a atrial fibrillation and a cardiologist who was pretty much chirping in her ear all the time about how she needed to be on meds for life and she couldn't heal this naturally. And she, if she didn't take her meds, um, you know, if she went against medical advice, she'd have a stroke and end up in diapers, like a lot of fear-based medicine tactics, which unfortunately you and I have seen a lot of, I'm sure, in our colleagues. Um, and she, um, I think she needed another cardiologist to kind of set her straight. So I was just so grateful that you were out there and she's worked with you and had resolution of her AFib and is off all her meds. And also I'll just start by way of saying, I, I have so much respect for you. I'm so grateful for what you're doing. And um, I would rather have you tell your story because you're much better at it than I, but I, we'd love to hear from you kind of how you got to where you are doing the important work you're doing on behalf of people's hearts. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Kristen. Thank you so much. So I am, I am a board certified cardiologist like my father before me. Uh, ever since I was a young boy, I wanted to be a cardiologist. I would watch my father uh, uh, very enviously amongst his colleagues, uh, talking, you know, talking medicine, talking shop. And I always wanted to be part of that conversation. And as time would go on, I would eventually fulfill that goal. I would father, follow in my father's footsteps. Uh, go to the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine, then do three years of internal medicine, three years of cardiology. And uh, uh, at, at, the, at the end of that time, uh, my father actually in his mid fifties was getting sick and he was becoming depressed. And we were stunned because my father never had that type of behavior. His motto was work hard and party hard. He worked hard, but he was the life of the party. He was the joke teller, the storyteller, just someone everyone loved to be around. And again, he had a lot of uh, uh, practice success. He was very well known as a cardiologist. He had certainly financial success as a cardiologist. He had a loving family and friends. Why would this guy be depressed? So we took him to see a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist put him on some drugs and the drugs didn't work. Uh, we took him to see a counselor and the counselor didn't have any good insight and information for us. And then his depression morphed into something more complicated where he would actually have trouble walking and, 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 and frequent falls, problems chewing and swallowing and developed this blank stare. And uh, he was labeled with Parkinsonism, so not classic Parkinson's with a arresting tremor or intention tremor, but other features that were similar. He was tried by the head of neurology in Arizona and the uh, uh, Barrows Neurologic Institute on some Parkinson's meds. They did not work. Uh, and then ultimately we would take him to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic would diagnose him with something called progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP for short, similar to Parkinson's, but the, there's no therapeutic uh, pharmaceuticals. And when I asked what the cause of this was, because I'm like, huh, you know, I'm a little concerned here. Is this like something I may get? 
Uh, and they said, we have no idea what causes that. Well, simultaneously and serendipitously at that time, I was introduced to a young woman who was a uh, doctor of chiropractic, a DC. And she told me exactly why my father was sick and dying. And we could talk about those things because certainly whatever led to his illness leads to uh, cardiovascular disease and all disease in the sense of uh, uh, you know, eating well, living well, thinking well, what are those violations that my father suffered and others suffered that leads to that condition and others? Uh, but ultimately she tells me, you need to become a DC. And I said, wait a second, I just finished up four years of medical school, three years internal, three years of cardiology. I'm on the job for three years. I'm in a highly lucrative cardiology practice uh, in, in Arizona on my way to being a senior partner in that group. And you want me to be a DC doctor of chiropractic? And she said, no, not DC doctor of chiropractic, DC doctor of cause. And I became a doctor of cause. I very quickly married uh, this woman. And here we are now, 17 years later, and we have uh, four beautiful children uh, and created a natural heart doctor is my company. My wife has a company called Wild Mamas, which is all about returning the inner wild of the mamas uh, and the mama bears to to their rightful you know place uh, on this earth. And um, that's my story. Sticking to it. Amazing. Um, and as I listen, I'm just struck by the the kinds of um, life experiences that doctors like you and me kind of have to live through to get out of the medical model. I mean, it's, it's, you know, obviously you met this amazing woman who had so many powerful words. And it, I wonder, do you think you would have been open to them if Western medicine that we'd been trained in wasn't already kind of failing your dad? Um, you know, that, that is a great question. I probably would not have been uh, quite as open, but I think as as someone puts that, you know, typically people get into the holistic space, you know, natural space like you and I, because uh, either they personally have had issues or the, you know, someone around them, someone they really care for has had those particular issues. Uh, but, you know, but to that point, when she told me this stuff and I would look around now with a new lens at my uh, at the practice, right? I mean, I'm seeing 60 to 70 patients a day and you look at all that sickness and the hospital as a revolving door. Someone comes in with a heart attack. We tune them up, we give them a stent, we give them pharmaceuticals, they go back out the door and then they come back in three months later, maybe a complication from one of the pharmaceuticals, maybe another heart attack, maybe, you know, again, like something's always going on and this revolving door process and then you look at it now through this the specter of, wait a second, people are not sick because of pharmaceutical deficiencies. Um, people who say, well, this is all gen you know, genetic. We love to blame things on genetics when it has nothing to do with genetics. Uh, and, and we look at it and we say, well, okay, we are not, we don't have heart attacks because we are deficient in statin drugs and aspirin. There's a reason why these things happen. And when we look at our medical training, it's just so embarrassing, even amongst like the DOs where it's supposed to be this more holistic version, which is so far from the truth. If anything, I think if the DOs in their defense, they've even swung more medical to prove that they're just as good as the medical doctors that, uh, you know, again, they, uh, you know, when, when you look at our training through that lens and like the we're so excited to write that first prescription drug and do these procedures. And you look back and you're like, how do we never talk about what to eat, what not to eat, how to live, how not to live, the think well component of everything and how, I don't know about you, I had one month of psychiatry, which was inpatient psychiatry, which was all dealing with people and trying to throw as many different pharmaceutical combinations at them when psychiatry, just like everything else, is about addressing eat well, live well, think well. And when we do that, uh, that's the success, you know, strategy, which is exciting and it's empowering, but it's also frustrating. And I guess, you know, divine intervention put my wife into my life, um, and put me on this path. So I try not to think about what would, you know, uh, if things didn't go that way, what would have happened? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it sounds like and you went to DO school or MD school. My father was the first, uh, my father went to osteopathic school. He was actually the first DO at the Cleveland Clinic in 1970, where I was born. He was also the first DO at the University of Iowa in their cardiology department. So I really wanted to go to DO school. And I, because when I learned about the possibility of getting an you know, osteopathic degree that would allow me to do manipulations and understand how to touch the body and diagnose things by with my hands. That just was exactly what felt right. And I interviewed at several DO schools and I was so turned off by the attitude of the students who basically were like, we're not real doctors. We're overcompensating. No, I'm not going to do this shit when I get out. I was like, are you kidding? This is like a better tool than anything else in the toolbox. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm always kind of saddened by that loss because it feels like this whole tradition that has been kind of swept under the rug by the DOs themselves. Do you, I mean, that's what sort of you hinted at. Do you feel like that's true or accurate? Yeah, no, I definitely do, which is unfortunate. Um, and, you know, again, the you know, osteopathic school was started because uh, A.T. Still, the founder of osteopathy, felt that the medical community at that time uh, was going in the wrong direction. It was kind of the dawn of a lot of surgical interventions. It was also the dawn of the pharmaceutical industry. It was also a time when they were using a lot of, you know, mercury and a lot of uh, lead-based, you know, you know, chemicals, uh, quote unquote, in the healing process. And he developed that methodology of using the manipulations of a bone and muscle to influence the, you know, the human frame. And that was really uh, simultaneously with the founding of chiropractic. So I think that chiropractic really has uh, become what osteopathic medicine should have. But the beauty of these practitioners, of which there are some, but not many, unfortunately, like you mentioned, there are some osteopathic med uh, uh, medical doctors that use uh, osteopathic medicine and therapies very similar to chiropractic, but then also they do have that ability to prescribe as the last resort when necessary. My father went to osteopathic school because he had a cousin who was a DO and he liked that kind of concept. I went to osteopathic school only because my father was a DO and that's all that I knew uh, at the time. And uh, I guess I would look back at it and say, well, there's plenty of osteopath, there's plenty of medical schools I could have gone to. I mean, heck, you know, uh, back in the day, Chicago Medical School, you could have had your MD degree if you're, you know, if you're uh, whoever would have come up with $250,000 as a donation to the school and then so on and so forth. Uh, but anyways, all that aside, uh, I think that uh, it is unfortunate what happened to the DO industry. I worked with, uh, you know, I was in the biggest cardiology group and there were MDs and there were some DOs in the group, but the DOs practice exactly the same way as the as the MDs uh, did. And it's unfortunate. And I like you, I, I look back on that and I wish I would have uh, paid a lot more attention to the osteopathic portion because again, I was focused on becoming a cardiologist right from the, from the beginning, but there were tremendous uh, pools uh, that, that could have been utilized. Yeah. Um, before we leave the topic of osteopathy, because we haven't actually ever talked about on the healing grove. And I, I, I would wonder if people who are interested in knowing more if they wanted to go to someone who actually still practices manipulations and is, is kind of steeped in the tradition, what is kind of a good litmus test for that if they're looking for someone? I think really just asking the questions, I mean, just like you would ask the questions of anybody, whether it's a holistic dentist or a chiropractor, you know, or, or a DO. Yeah. Do you, you know, perform uh, osteopathic manipulation? Uh, if you want to ask them, what is your advanced training in that? Maybe they had advanced training. Um, uh, typically, if they say that they do that as part and parcel of their practice, I think that that would be a phenomenal, phenomenal primary care doctor uh, for anybody, uh, you know, to go see or specifically for osteopathic manipulation. Truthfully, again, I'm married to a chiropractor. I believe that the chiropractors uh, have really extensive training in manipulation uh, uh, in the chiropractic adjustment, and they're probably going to be your go-to uh, in that arena. But the other thing too is maybe asking like uh, other friends. Sometimes I get on the social media, you know, I mean, asking around and oftentimes you can find good DOs. And you know what, uh, Kristen, I, I'm very critical of the DOs uh, uh, outwardly. And I often get emails or text messages from people and they say, hey, wait a second, I'm a DO. 
And I'm one of the good ones. I'm one of the people who do things the right way. So don't throw all of us under the bus. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, I think it's a little bit few and far between. Uh, and, and just, you know, listen, go to someone, experience what it is, whether it is a chiropractor, a dentist, uh, speaking with me, get that experience. And if you like that experience, then you can stick with it. If you don't, you know, you move on. You hire a plumber to come into your house. You don't like that experience. Well, you're probably not going to use that plumber again. You know, and I think the same thing applies to our healthcare. Absolutely. I mean, I really encourage my patients to think about their healing team and their doctor and their other providers are part of that healing team. If they're not a healing presence on your healing team, you need to get rid of them and fill that spot with someone else who can better do the job. So you mentioned that genetics have very little to do with illness. And this is, uh, although I completely agree with you, it's still a very controversial statement. You know, we've been so obsessed with, you know, the human genome project in the last 20 years and all the, all the little snips and mutations we can find, the polymorphisms that tell us what we think we can know about, you know, human health and illness. Um, one of my mentors like to say, you know, genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. Um, I wonder if you would speak to this and maybe get into the eat well, think well, live well bits that sort of apply to this environmental input. Yeah, I, you know, I guess when you think about genetics, you think about our, our DNA and all the DNA is, is a code for, uh, for proteins that our body makes. And then the proteins all get together and do various, you know, you know thousands and millions of other things in the body. But whoever built us, call that person God, uh, call it evolution, whatever whatever, whatever anyone wants to uh, believe in. Me personally, I believe in a creator. Um, we were built perfectly. We can run and jump and see and hear and smell and taste and feel and love. And we can... Uh, as a man, do our part in making babies and women can do their part in making babies. Look at all these different miracles that we're talking about. How does bad genetics come into that? How does a genetic programming for coronary artery disease come into that or, or genetic programming for cancer? It doesn't. Everything is from man-made pollutants man-made violations of eat well, live well, think well. And I am, Kristen, I'm blaming it on the men because the men are truly responsible for the vast majority of all these poisons that we're talking about. So I will throw the men uh, under the bus on that one. Uh, it just doesn't make sense that we, you know, when people say, you know, genetics, half of the adult population in the United States is labeled with high blood pressure. Is that bad genetics? Half the people have bad genes? Again, it just doesn't make sense. So with that being said, to your point, the genes load the gun and the environment and all these violations of eat well, live well, think well, pull the trigger. Uh, a, a loaded gun is not dangerous unless the trigger is pulled. So we may have some genetic, I guess, Predis you know, predispositions, but in a healthy world, that trigger never gets pulled. So yes, some families have um, a lot of breast cancer, and some families have a lot of Parkinson's, and some families have a lot of coronary artery disease. So there is, when you overlay the poison onto someone's genetics or the family's genetics, you'll see a lot of cancers, you'll see a lot of heart disease, you'll see a lot of neurologic disease. In some cases, you see all the above. But it all stems from, again, the 21st century violations of eat well, live well, think well, uh, eating the wrong foods, not eating enough of the right foods, uh, not getting a, into the live well category, the sleep, the sunshine, the physical activity, the chiropractic care or osteopathic manipulation, the holistic dental uh, aspect of things. And then you get into this environmental toxins category, which I think make one of the biggest offenders, if not the biggest offender, is mold mycotoxicity from water damaged buildings. Um, and then you get that there. And then you get the think well uh, component. And the think well component, I think also is just, as we mentioned, just so under um, uh, underappreciated that when someone is not thinking well, 
when they have stress, fear, anxiety, worry, uh, anger, depression, social isolation, and their body is thrown into a pure sympathetic state. The sympathetic state is the fight or flight. And if you don't engage the parasympathetic, which is rest, digest, and repair, if your system is never resting and repairing, you cannot heal. The body can never be healthy in that state. Right. Beautiful overview. I have a thousand questions. My first question is, if someone, if someone said, just tell me what to eat, make it not too complicated, but like, tell me what to eat and not to eat, what would you say? Well, the first thing I want to say is that there is a gazillion different diets out there. And you and I could talk for hours trying to state the case for whatever we believe in. Uh, and still, again, we'll still run into it. Now, me personally, again, I believe in hunter-gatherer. I believe in our ancestral diet that our ancestors did since the dawn of human existence. But I do want to use this opportunity to say, no matter what diet you follow, vegan, vegetarian, Mediterranean, paleo, keto, carnivore, whatever it is, make sure your food is organic. Get the chemicals out of your food. If we can all agree on that, that would be a good thing. I don't think there's anybody promoting the pesticide diet, right? So eat as much conventional pesticide rich foods as possible. I don't think anyone's doing that, fortunately, although somebody probably will, courtesy of you know, Monsanto and others. So if you eat ice cream, make sure it's organic ice cream. If you eat chocolate, make sure it's organic chocolate. If you have uh, breakfast cereal, skip the frosted flakes and use some kind of organic product. So that way, uh, you know, people who are going to do these behaviors of eating sugar, eating starchy carbs, if they're going to do those things, at least they're getting the chemicals out of their food. And I think that that's a good start. I also like to say that focus more on the food that you should be eating as opposed to what you're, uh, what you shouldn't be eating. Because when you have a lot of intention on eating certain healthy foods, it kind of crowds out some of the desire for other stuff. So if I wake up in the morning and say, okay, um, I'm going to have salmon and eggs today for breakfast. And I, and I make an intention to do that. Then again, I'm not making an opportunity for some kind of a cereal or some, you know, pancakes, gluten free pancakes, for example, because I know that I have to eat that first. And I tell myself, you know what? I'm going to allow for pancakes. I'm going to allow for cereal. I'm going to allow for some kind of sugar after I eat the salmon and eggs. And every time I'm not craving it. Now I make, you know, have a little piece of fruit or something like that. But, uh, that's kind of my approach. I try and wake up every day and say, okay, when am I going to eat some seafood today? When am I going to eat some nose to tail uh, uh, animal based food today? Uh, and the other thing I would throw into there is that me personally, I'm always 100% gluten free. I never cheat. I never eat gluten. There's no reason to eat gluten from wheat, barley and rye. Uh, it's just, there's no nutritional value to it. I've seen a lot of health problems from it. We do advanced testing where we identify a lot of problems from it. So I choose to avoid it. Great. I mean, I've read your book. I'll mention your book right now. And at the end too, this is the book that is still, is it still free with shipping and handling? You can get it on your website. Such a gift. It's called the paleo cardiologist, the natural way to heart health. It's amazing. And I found nothing in this book to take issue with. In fact, I wish I'd written a book, although I'm not a cardiologist. So you were the right person to write it. But I was like, yes, everything here is correct. You know, sometimes you'll find little bits here and there and be like, meh, I don't know about that piece. But I loved it from tail to nose or whatever you just said. Um, well, it's common. Well, it's common sense methodology too, which I think, you know, it's, it's not even that the doctors lost. It's like the medical doctors never had the common sense approach. You know this as well as I do from, again, the first day of medical school. It's just... Pharma, it's surgery. It's never about these, you know, causative things. And I think that the book, uh, certainly we talk about paleo, hunter-gatherer nutrition, but it's also about that paleo lifestyle. And with the understanding that we're always arguing about the food side of things, but the live well and the think well is just as important as the eat well component. And uh, 
uh, we need to continue to stress that as much as possible to people. So I want to ask you, of all the think well violations, as you like to call them, which I think is hilarious, um, of all the think well violations, I I personally can find myself getting very angry with my medical tribe, or I should say my former medical tribe, because, well, obviously because it does so much harm and so many of my patients who come to me with these complex chronic issues have been gaslit by these doctors, you know, my, my, my colleagues, our colleagues, gaslit by our tribe. And, um, it makes me really angry. And I, I have my tools for working on that. I want to know if you still get angry with Western medicine as it is. Um, I do. <laughs> I certainly, certainly, certainly get angry with my cardio uh, cardiology colleagues. You know, um, you know, again, if you say gaslit, it's kind of like, you know, the woman that we mentioned at the beginning, you know, uh, and, and she's on pharmaceutical blood thinners and, she's told she's going to have a stroke if she doesn't take them when the doctor never took the time like I did to say, hey, let's talk about what your stroke risk is. Let's go to the chadsvast.org calculator and let's see what the stroke, you, the st actual percentage of stroke risk you have on an annual basis. And when people look at that after they've been on pharmaceutical blood thinners, anticoagulants, you know, for years, and they're like, wait a second, my annual stroke risk was 2%. And the pharmaceutical anticoagulant, according to their data, lowered my annual stroke risk to 1% with the potential for bleeding. That's not what they told me. They didn't say 2% chance versus 1% chance. They told me that if I didn't take it, I was going to have a stroke. So it is that fear, which... You know, for those of you with children out there, and again, these days, kind of like that term bully, which we know from our childhood, but it's much uh, more uh, aware and spoken about today. It's such a bad, it's a four letter word, you know, bully, that when we bully, you know, somewhere around, doctors are the worst bullies of all. My way or the highway, the God complex of what they have, do this procedure, take this pharmaceutical. So you're right, Kristen, it is very frustrating when we see this amongst our colleagues, uh, I guess in general, they're just brainwashed to do what they do. They know what they know. So it's not even necessarily their fault, but yet it is frustrating in our standpoint. Let me take, let me wrap this point up, you know, real quick. I saw, I, I did a consultation on a guy who lives in London. It was a virtual consultation. He's exactly my age. He's 52 years of age. And he feels perfectly fine. His doctor says, you know, I think you should get a coronary calcium scan. Uh, a lot of people are doing it, provides a lot of information. So the guy gets a coronary calcium scan. His scan shows his levels and he does a coronary calcification. It leads to a stress test, which it shouldn't have, but he gets a stress test. The stress test is a little bit abnormal. And then they do an angiogram on him. And that showed that he's got a 70% blockage and he gets two stents that are placed. One of the stents has a problem with it. It requires a third and a fourth stent. And that was what was done. Now you could be listening right now and say, well, they found a 70% blockage and they stented it. That's a good thing. The literature does not support that. The literature tells us that putting stents into people without symptoms has no value. The literature also tells us that putting stents into people for symptoms does not prevent heart attacks, does not save lives, and is unnecessary. So the only benefit for uh, stents are for people with symptoms. And again, here is this 50-year-old male who went through this whole process None of it was necessary. So to your point, this obviously is frustrating. You can tell for those who are listening to my story that yes, I do get frustrated, but I think that there is this uh, you know, movement going on right now because of doctors like you and I, Dr. Kristen, who are, are helping people wake up to the reality that there's a better way. Yeah, that's a, that's a painful, but all too common story to listen to. What would you have done differently in this guy? This is a great opportunity for us to hear your process, I think. Yes. 
so ideally, the 52-year-old comes to see me and says, I'm 52. Uh, I'm concerned about, you know, about, uh, you know, heart disease or, or longevity or cancer, whatever it may be. Uh, that person would likely come in and say, I've got a family history or my best friend recently had a heart attack. Like, I mean, again, like they're coming in and they want to prevent something from happening. So the way to prevent is to educate people through the lens of eat well, live well, think well. And then we test, don't guess. We do the most advanced testing in the world to uncover uh, problems. What are markers of inflammation, oxidative stress, intracellular vitamins and minerals? Can we measure your toxic burden? And the answer is yes. And then we find out all of the bad things or in the bad column of these people. And then how do we work together to move them into the good column as we test further down the road? And I think that is ultimately where our success comes in truly for prevention. And we do things without radiation, without dangerous, uh, risky procedures in the short and the long term. Can people do an ultrasound? Can people do a plain treadmill stress test? If need be, yes, they can do all those things. But that's how I like to do it <clears throat> um, in, in my world. And then again, once you get all that detailed granular information, then work on improving it. So let's 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 fantasize a little bit about what this guy actually had going on. Like, give us kind of your first, like, what are the usual culprits in his sort of a case? Asymptomatic, 52, but he's got these plaques in his heart. Yeah, and, and really, and to that point, it's like when, when I hear someone's history, I can just tell them, like, you likely have plaque in your heart. Because if someone comes in and they're like, well, you know, my father had such and such, my uncle had such and such, my brother had such and such. Uh, do you live the same lifestyle as your brother, uncle, or, or you know, uh, father? Uh, when the answer is yes, then they likely have coronary artery disease. If someone grew up in a home where they were exposed to, you know, the secondhand smoke, they likely have coronary artery disease. When someone had, so let's just assume everybody has coronary artery disease. We don't need to scan them. What are we going to do about it? So somebody again who comes in, you know, like that. We just get detailed of, okay, listen, you likely have this. Let's talk about the foods you're going to eat. You know, are you eating enough wild seafood? Are you eating enough nose to tail ethically raised animals? Uh, are you eating enough organic vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds and avocados and olives and coconuts? Are you avoiding the chemical rich foods? Are you getting appropriate sleep? Let's talk about that. Are you getting appropriate sunshine? Let's talk about that. Are you avoiding environmental chemicals? Have you tested your home for mold? Have you seen a holistic dentist? Are you under the care of a physical medicine practitioner, chiropractic, you know, deal or other? Uh, are you getting, are you moving? Are you, are you active? Are you, I, I see a lot of people who are truckers. Um, uh, uh, I just, before I got on this call, I was on with a trucker radio and talking about the men and women, the millions of people who are on the highways and it's a very unhealthy profession by definition. How do we get these people to move? How do we get them to be active? Uh, and it's not about going to the gym and, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, putting your earbuds in, uh, you know, and, and being in a toxic environment. It's not about that. It's just about getting outside and being movement. And then again, are you thinking well? Are you in a place of self-acceptance? Are you living in a sense of purpose? Do you have that spirituality uh, in your life? Do you have a good sense of community? And of course, that's what the Healing Grove, you know, is where you've created this community for people uh, to be, to, to have this sense uh, of, of friendship and kinship that a lot of us now are missing from our past life, you know, our former, you know, friends and family members uh, who we no longer associate with because of all the reasons why we understand. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, and again, just finding you're happy. Uh, doing everything you can to find your happy, uh, coming up with strategies to deal with uh, when things are not so happy in your life. And again, that's all uh, extremely important. So that's what I told and taught to, you know, this 52 year old male uh, and everybody else who I encounter. Uh, and ultimately, yeah, we want to reduce and eliminate pharmaceuticals and dangerous procedures. And 
it's very empowering. It's very exciting. And it's, and it's the truth and it works. And uh, unfortunately, as you know, Dr. Kristen, there's a lot of people who stand in our way of, of dispensing the truth and teaching the truth. But we're not going to focus on those people. We've all got those people in our lives, but we just have to understand that there is a right way to do things. And when we do that, we will be rewarded. Yeah, well, those are all true words. I'm wondering about the don't guess test because it sounds like you're not really testing for the, you're assuming cardiovascular disease pretty much because of our kind of, kind of common modern lifestyle, but you're not assuming mold and heavy metals and chemicals, like the kinds of things that, you know, vibrant tests, I know you, you're looking for those. So tell me about that. Is looking for that specifically helpful because you have different um, tools for, you know, different mycotoxins, for example, or for different heavy metals or is that because people need to see it on paper? I often test because I think people need to see it on paper to be kind of convinced to go that route and actually do something about it. Yeah, and I think that's especially true about uh, about something like uh, you know gluten, for example, where we can test people through Vibrance Wheat Zoomer and look for leaky guts, uh, and we can look at uh, the antibodies or the you know immune uh, production against certain proteins in the gluten molecule, gluten protein. So once we give people that data in not only black and white, right, but also in beautiful color, and we show people and we educate people in this team approach, right? I mean, it's, you know, so often medicine is kind of, like, again, that bully approach, um, you know, I, I'm the doctor, I'm in charge, you listen to me, uh, as opposed to the way that you and I practice, which is, again, is a partnership. Hey, let's really discuss all these different things so you get a good understanding, you know, where we're coming from. And... Uh, that's where, yeah, showing those environmental toxins because people say, I eat organic. Like, hey, well, look at your levels of glyphosate. They're sky high. It's coming from somewhere. We get detailed on that. Everybody feels good until the day that they don't. You know, e you know even cancer people, cancer people often feel wonderful and then they get this diagnosis. So you have to get detailed information about what's going on internally. The markers of inflammation, if you're inflamed, you better figure out why, because inflammation is the common denominator to all disease. It's not really a problem in and of itself. It's a sign that there is a problem and you have to find those problems. Back to our person with atrial fibrillation. We know that people with atrial fibrillation also have a higher risk of cancer and they also have a higher risk of dementia. So you can go on pharmaceuticals for AFib and they may be successful. You can have an ablation for AFib and it may be successful. But if you don't find the cause of why you have AFib, then you will get cancer, you will get dementia and you will not live a full productive life. Yeah, I'm, I really appreciate you saying that. I was talking to a friend over the weekend who had breast cancer two years ago and just kind of got through that whole thing and all the surgeries and everything. And, and she's, she's not eating well, <laughs> she's not living well, she's not thinking well. And I, I brought up to her, I said, you know, cancer is not really a tumor. It's more of a process and the tumors might be gone, but like the process that created them hasn't changed. And she said, well, no, my cancer was genetic and the walls went up and there was no openness to talk about it. Um, which I, I just feel like we're missing such an opportunity with the, with the message that most of medicine gives, gives, gives us. You know, it's so sad. Well, I think also this really highlights, that, you know, at this point for us to be able to talk about the freedom for doctors like you and I to speak this particular truth, because there are powers that be that would like to limit our freedom to get this information out there. Like, say, for example, if you're the CEO or on the board of directors of Pfizer, Merck, AstraZeneca, um, uh, you know, Moderna, whatever it may be, you do not want any other message except for what suits your, you know, your revenue stream and your profitability. So uh, the, the, the freedom to have these discussions, I think, is paramount because that's how we can continue to uh, tell our stories and tell these things online, you know, like this, uh, or speaking freely to other people. And, uh, you know, all, all you can do is tell people the truth and then what they do with that truth is up to them. Uh, and your friend with breast cancer, uh, unfortunately, you and I both know that her life expectancy is very, very limited 
in her current you know, medical paradigm. So if she were to go to her doctor and say, okay, uh, what's, what's my over under here? What's my life expectancy? That doctor would have to give a number to say, well, you had stage three cancer. We did X, Y, Z therapies. And because of that, your life expectancy, let's say is seven years, or let's say it's 12 years, whatever their number they're going to give, uh, give, if they can give that detailed number, which they always should be able to, uh, life expectancy after a cancer diagnosis with certain uh, you know, treatments, is that good enough for you? Like I saw, I saw a guy, he's 56 years old. He's got three uh, uh, teenage children. He's got ischemic cardiomyopathy. So he's had a heart attack and he's got a defibrillator. And I said, on multiple pharmaceuticals, he's 56. I said, you're over under. The chances of you making it five years are 50%. Your life expectancy is 50, is, is five years. 61, is that good enough for you? That's what the medical model offers you with all the drugs and defibrillators. That's what you, that's, we know that information. We're the home of the 100 year heart. Do you want to work with us and achieve that potentially? Or do you want to stay in the medical system where your life average expectancy is five years? Give people that information. And if we say that to your friend and say, I hope you're cured. I hope you never have this uh, happen to you again. But just so you know, this is the numbers. This is what you need to know that maybe they didn't tell you. Life expectancy and, and a lot of this, you know, information is out there. And uh, again, the medical doctors, they're not providing it because they don't feel the, the need to. And they don't have any alternative anyway. So what, what do they care? I mean, you know, it's like, this is just what we know. Yeah, well, they don't they don't have another tool. I, I I often have to fall back on that when I get start to get really angry. It's like like they're it's ignorance. They don't know there's another way. And there's a very powerful sense of if you suddenly do something different, you have to acknowledge that for the last 25 years, you've really been missing the boat. You've really been missing the boat. And that's a that's a hard pill to swallow for anybody. Yeah, I'm with you totally on that, right? Um, you know, to to look back. I mean, listen, obviously you're medically trained, you know, and, and neither you or I look at our training as a waste because it created the people that we are today. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's very important. Um, but, you know, to get people, you know, to get these doctors, not only to break the, um, you know, break them out of the matrix, if you will, from their training and everything you've ever learned has been built on a foundation of lies and untruths. Um, to, that's one thing, but then also to break them out of the financial model because they are heavily reimbursed for the the activities you know that they do. And so you know you take someone who may be open to the truth, but they look at it. Wait a second. Okay, now well how am I gonna how am I gonna make a living? How am I gonna you know uh, how am I going to pay my mortgage or pay my medical school loans or pay for my, you know, son or daughter's, you know, uh, college tuition? Like, how am I going to pay my bills uh, by opting out of this? So I think I think there's a multiple barriers uh, to to people doing that. And therefore, it just makes them a lot more steadfast in really condemning um uh, the, the the stuff the the information that you and I you know provide out there and um, you know I mean ultimately I mean, let me also take a look at you know statin drugs for example so we can say statin drugs lower cholesterol that's for sure but we don't care about lowering cholesterol we want to know if I swallow this pharmaceutical does it lower my chances of heart attack stroke or dying and the answer is in the case of statins through meta analysis when you throw you know hundreds of thousands of people into a you know a big uh, uh, pot and take a look at at their numbers statin drugs lower heart attack stroke and mortality by a tiny bit so it's not about how do we lower your chances of having a heart attack from 5% to 4.5% on an annual basis we want to know can we lower your risk to 0% we know that the medical side doesn't do that because we have their data, five versus 4.5. When we work in a holistic realm, 
doing all those things of eat well, live well, think well, that's where we get to the 0% category because we are built to not have heart attacks. So when we fix all that, that is the strategy. Their side is a failure. So is anyone studying and publishing on this? Because you know, there are people who will say, well, until I see it in a published, never mind that the other studies were biased and had conflicts of interest, right? But they want another head-to-head -head study to be like, well, look what diet and exercise can do. I mean, there, I know there's tons of studies on the Mediterranean diet for heart health and all that, but are you like capturing all your data for the 100-year health, 100-year heart? Uh, I, I guess the answer is, is that first of all, the way that you and I speak is common sense. So when everyone listens to this, it's hard to really argue with it unless, unless you're a medical doctor or you've got some extreme influence uh, on the medical side. Again, like you're, you're, you're tied in with pharma, you know, your revenue is with pharma, you're a pharmaceutical rep or whatever it may be. Um, so it really is the common sense approach, which who's going to argue with that? Who's going to argue with eating clean food? Who's going to, when I tell people again, you got to go to sleep shortly after the sun down, who would argue with that? Nobody who, you know, when you think about it from the lens of common sense of we all should be getting plenty of sunshine because all plants and all animals live outside in the sun. All of them. They're not getting cancer. They're not dying. People with the highest levels of vitamin D naturally live the longest, live the best, lowest risk of everything. And vitamin D comes from the sun. So when you tell people these basic, you know, tenets, uh, that's going to be the strategy. Regarding doing a study, who's going to pay for it, right? Studies are paid for, as you know, by the pharmaceutical industry. So you're not going to get a study done. You can get case reports, obviously, we can talk about, hey, this is a person's before and this is their after. And then the medical side will come at us. Well, that's just a you know case report. That's, there's no double blind randomized placebo control trial. Well, how are we gonna get a double blind randomized placebo control trial on a group of people in the medical system eating McDonald's cookies and cupcakes, not getting sleep, not getting sun, not getting chiropractic care, living in the chemicals. And then how do we compare them to a group of people who try and live like we do? It's it's not going to happen. And if you wait for it, yeah, you're going to be waiting a long time. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm playing devil's advocate because often people who come to me are for the most part women who are not satisfied with how they feel. They feel they're lacking in vitality. They might have chronic fatigue issues. They might have brain fog. They might have some, you know, the whole constellation, right? The whole usual list of things that make people feel crappy. And we know it's the mold in their house and we know it's the food they're eating. And we know it's the fact that their husband will let them buy organic foods, but their husband sort of feels fine, isn't really fine, right? But feels fine and is like, no way are we spending money like three times as much on organic. No way are we remediating the mold. Like that's just not going to happen. So I think a lot of people, it is common sense, but a lot of people maybe have just never felt good enough to know there's a difference between how they feel and, you know, how they could feel. I don't know. Yeah, that's totally true. I mean, again, we should all feel amazing. We should all feel absolutely amazing. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to, to say to the women, I get it, you know, um, uh, so many women are struggling and their husband is not listening. Their husband is, uh, and, and they're wrong. And it's, and it's, it's very sad. The husband, like you said, doesn't want to spend the money, doesn't want to test the home, doesn't want to remediate the home because they feel fine and they feel fine. Well, they're on five pharmaceuticals. They've got erectile dysfunction. They've got no libido, you know, but they're just perfectly fine sitting on the couch, having a beer, watching television, you know, taking a nap. Life is good for them. Um, because they just, again, because they, they, they do also don't know what it means and what it feels like to be, have that sense of vitality and vibrancy. They don't know either. And they may have had a heart attack and, uh, you know, they're, they've, there's, as they sit there on the couch, they've got cancer, you know, in the wings, but again, they feel fine. The women are the canary in the coal mine. And I think that, uh, again, this goes back to ancestral days of, when a woman 
uh, feels danger, senses danger, senses toxicity, they don't, uh, they don't ovulate, they don't, um, uh, you know, reproduce in that time, because they are in this kind of fight or flight mode. And that's what the chemicals and poisons do to the women, uh, and therefore gives them that, you know, kind of like that sixth sense, you know, like, something doesn't smell right here, I need to get out of here, because this is not a good place to have a, uh, a child. So that's where I think that comes from. Uh, but to the mold story, you know, Kristen, I, for anyone who wants to watch it too, I've got a mold video on my website over at Natural Heart Doctor. It's 45 minutes long. It's all about mold mycotoxins and cardiovascular disease. It's applicable to anybody with any condition. But of course, it's a, it's a cardiology focused lecture. It's right there in the lecture, all the bullet points, all the information right from the scientific literature. And one of my first slides from that presentation is the woman and the man in the doctor's office. And the man is sitting there, put my uh, computer over here. The man's sitting there in the office, his arms are crossed, you know, and he's like looking at his wife like, oh, this woman's crazy. I'm not spending money on any of this stuff. Here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen, ladies in particular, you're going to die. You're going to die in that environment. So if you don't do something about it, if you don't get that knucklehead to understand something, you better be worth willing to die over it because you're going to be sick and you're not going to make it. It's just, it's just the way that it is. So if you can't convince this other person in your life, uh, you either do something about it or again, you'll suffer the consequences and uh, I and let me say this, and I'm not telling anybody to do anything that they're not comfortable with, or you know, uh, I, I don't want to be accused of saying this, although I've been accused of a lot of things. If I was doing if I was doing certain things, if I said to my wife, you know, once a week, I think that our kids should have Dairy Queen, or our kids should eat. Uh, uh, Burger King or, you know, uh, uh, you know, Wendy's or McDonald's. I, I think that they deserve that. It's not a big deal. You know what my wife would say? Kristen, you know exactly what my wife would say, right? You know, if I would say, it's not a big deal if we live in mold. It's not a big deal if the kids stay up and they're on tech or they're using, you know, VR glasses. It's not a big deal once in a while. My wife would say, bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jack. Get out. Bye-bye. I'm calling my attorney. That, that's what she would say. Now, um, that's my experience with it. And I think ultimately that uh, it's a dramatic and a drastic step, but we're talking about your health here. And if you're living in mold, if you're living in the poison, if your husband doesn't understand the value of eating organic food, listen, Dr. Kristen and I would be more than ha happy to continue to pr produce information that. A lot of times, too, just say to them, hey, listen, watch this video. Read this article, please. If you love me, if you care for me, if you care about yourself at all, watch this video. Read this article. Let's just talk about it. Um, and that's about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one of the only steps that we could take. But the, the cost of not doing this truly is your health, your vitality, your longevity, and and your life. Yeah, well said. That's a powerful public service announcement and you know ultimatum. So thank you for that. I have one last question that I kind of want to nerd out with you about, but then I want to save a little bit of time for questions. So I'm going to quickly ask it. And if you can answer it quickly, then we can get a few questions from the Grove members. My question is lipid panel. So I've stopped ordering lipid panels many years ago. I'm, I feel like I'm still in my learning mode of like what should I be ordering? I definitely like the cardiac panel on Vibrant. The LP little A seems really valuable because it's something we can do something about and obviously oxidation and inflammation. What are your thoughts about the clotting mutations that can also set people up for risk? Like I've been looking for PAI1 and factor V Leiden and finding it sometimes and putting people on Baluk, but like, what are you doing for that piece of it? And why should we not trust lipid panels by themselves? Yeah, especially the 1970s lipid panels, you know, that my father, you know, was running, you know, back in the day, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. I find, I, I find the only thing really of value there, really, Kristen, is the triglyceride component of that. Uh, in order to say, okay, your triglycerides are high, uh, we got to do something about it, eat less carbs, eat more seafood, that's the strategy there. 
Um, as it relates to, you know, again, with lipids in general, I would agree. It's just, I, I kind of do it just because I feel that people want it. I'm really just concerned about those markers of inflammation. If you're inflamed, you better figure out why. If you're not inflamed on those markers, we can certainly get a lot more detailed, but that's a really good start when your HSCRP, PLA2, uh, your uh, OX LDL, your MPO, when those are under control, important. I love testing homocysteine, making sure that's under control. You mentioned LP little a, a nasty genetic marker uh, that I don't believe was a problem back in the day. I believe it was beneficial. That's why the gene exists. The protein exists. Uh, but in the modern day world, it's uh, it's not healthy to have that. And therefore, it's good to know about your LP parentheses, you know, small a or LP uh, little a. So I think it is important, uh, you know, again, for, for looking at these markers of hypercoagulability, certainly more so in the person who's had an event, maybe someone who's got uh, a history of miscarriages or infertility, somebody who's got a history of migraine headaches. Somebody, of course, who's got a history of blood clots, uh, then it's important to get more detailed um, because, because with, with those things, then we may dial in more natural anticoagulants, you know, with those people. Or ultimately, we can say, listen, you're someone who's had recurrent deep venous thrombosis, and you have factor five Leiden, or as you mentioned, prothrombin gene mutation. Those obviously would be the most common ones. Uh, in that scenario, we may give that person more of a choice and say, listen, I don't have a problem with you being on long-term pharmaceutical anticoagulants for your condition. If you would like to try our methodology, I would support you through that because we need to make each person different from what they were before they got sick, mm -hmm. okay? You need to become a different person. I've often said you cannot heal in the same environment where you got sick. What does that mean? Wait a second, you mean I'm, I'm, I have to move? I have to move out of my existence? In some cases, yes but you have to make yourself and your environment different from when you got sick. Now that may mean finding mold mycotoxins. It may mean living life under the uh, uh, concept of everything you bring into your home, is it natural or is it poison? If it's poison, you don't bring it into your home. And if you are living with someone who says, um, well, I, I wash my clothes and tied. That's the way it's going to be. Uh, there's nothing, you know, that we're going to do about it. That's not a healthy person. That's not a healthy relationship. We got to, we got to really work on that. And again, I can only tell you in my household, should I come in and say to my wife, Hey, I don't feel like my clothes are getting that clean. I like the, I like the smell of, you know, of pods or whatever. I mean, I, I want my clothes to have, you know, uh, uh, you know, bounce fabric softener. My wife says to me, Jack Wolfson, just as if I walked in, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take up uh, smoking. I'm going to smoke once a week. You know, hey, if our kids want to smoke once a week, that's fine too. We need to really uh, lay down the law, ladies. We really, really, really need to lay down the law. Because again, it's not only your health, it's their health and longevity. And sometimes us men, you got to just really knock it in a little bit um, to make us understand it. Awesome. All right. Thank you for that. I'm going to end by just sharing something that um, our, our mutual patient just put in the chat. She wrote, thank you, Dr. Wolfson. Always enjoy all your talks. I'm having a wonderful summer and feeling great with no AFib. Thanks for being my cardiologist, my, my great cardiologist. Both you and Dr. Ryman give me happy tears. So thank you so much for this. This has been awesome. Really, really appreciate your time and you sharing your wisdom with us today in the Healing Grove. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Healing Grove podcast. If you liked it, please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you wanna deepen your experience further, consider grabbing a copy of the Healing Grove playbook. 
with journal prompts for this podcast and 41 others, it's the perfect place to record your learnings, keep track of the tools you explore, and reflect on your own experience. Finally, it's important to mention that even though I am a doctor, nothing you hear on this podcast, whether from myself or my guests, constitutes medical advice. Any intervention you try should always be discussed with and supervised by a trusted member of your own healing team. Thanks for listening and see you next time in the Healing Grove.